Good morning. Today we are reading from the Gospel of John. We are almost all the way at the end in chapter 20. We are reading verses 19 through 31. You can listen and be fully immersed or you can find that in your Bible or on your app and read along with me this morning. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And he said this. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand on his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. And Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are now written in this book. But these are written so that you can come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of God's holy word. This is our Sunday. This is our second Sunday of Easter. And we know in our tradition, we celebrate Easter a whole lot of Sundays. So happy Resurrection Sunday, happy Easter. Our sermonic theme today is show me, show me. Regina met this special person on a dating website. Half a century old, she was looking for someone to grow old with and find companionship. Her kids were almost grown. Her kids would almost be out of the house. She was feeling comfortable in her job and felt like it was a good time to begin exploring the possibility of a new relationship. She immediately felt a connection to this guy named Kenny. He was a Christian just like her, and she felt that they shared the same values. They would talk about God, and each Sunday after church, they would talk about their church experiences and what they had heard at their church and the music they had sang and what the sermon was about, and they got excited. They began to pray for others. They began to pray for each other, and she could feel herself really, really getting into and falling for Kenny. Kenny began to talk about you know, closing up his job and moving closer to her so that they could begin to date in person. Kenny had his own business and his business was experiencing difficulty. And so he reached out to her one day awkwardly, but he reached out to Regina and asked her if she could loan him some money. He promised that in 24 to 48 hours, he would get her the money back. Well, Regina, being a woman of God, decided to pray about it, and she prayed about it, and she felt a release. 
Regina was a generous person. She loved sharing, and she felt like this was right and that God was leading her to give this money to Kenny. Well, she gave the money to Kenny, and something happened, one thing after another, and it seemed like Kenny needed more money before he had paid back the money that he promised to give her. Well, this went on for a couple of times, and she thought, it's my money. She never shared it with anyone else but thought, hey, it's my money to do responsibly with what I want to do with it. And so she shared, and they continued to pray together, and they continued to grow, and she grew closer to him. By now, you're probably suspecting that Regina became a victim of what's called romance scams. All over the world, victims are preyed on, told what they want to hear, and then when rapport is billed, the person moves in to ask for money. They sometimes will pay it back initially to build trust and then ask for more money. Over in Texas just this year, a woman was scammed out of $100,000. Regina says she lost any inheritance she could pass down to her kids. She lost the ability to live comfortably after retirement. But more than that, she lost her feeling of trust. She lost emotionally, and she had what was experienced as a very traumatic experience. After this, Regina says, show me. Regina says to others, if you ever have feelings for someone, ask that person to show you proof of who they are. Show me. Show me. We live in such a capitalistic society that Regina's story is no longer an exception. More and more scams are taking place that take advantage of people's goodness. A few weeks ago, on Good Friday, my, uh, the leader of one of our denominations, we're affiliated with three, Presbyterian, Methodist, UCC, but one of those denominations, the leader reached out to me and said, hey, I'm in a meeting, but I need to connect with you later. There's something important that's come up, it's confidential. I, thinking, oh my God, I can be of service, I can help our leader, felt like right away. I wrote back, yes, I'm available. Let me know what's going on. And then another email came, and it was when that email came that I began to wonder, was this in fact our leader? So because I had his cell phone, I reached out to him personally and said, is this you writing me? And he said, no, it's a scam. Well, by the next day, they had issued a letter to the all of the congregation and shared that this scam was going on, and please not respond. Well, if that wasn't enough, last week I got a similar message from another denominational leader asking for help. It was confidential. I needed to keep it private. Well, this time I recognized it right off and wrote this leader and said, hey, I think that your email has been hacked. I knew the drill, and within a day, sure enough, this denomination as well issued an email saying it wasn't from this person. Do not respond to the email. Of course we recognize a scam, except of course we don't. And usually there's one or two people that really believe it and are taken advantage of. And they come out of it feeling a little bit more distrustful of people, a little more distrustful, like we always gotta look over our shoulder. Like we always gotta make sure we're not being taken advantage of. God's people, good people not knowing if someone is trying to take advantage of them. Show me. Show me you're really who you say you are. Show me that I can trust you. This is where we enter the biblical text. This is the time period. The disciples hadn't recovered from the grief and loss of Jesus. Their leader had been arrested and tried and found guilty and executed. The climate in the air is tense. You already saw they're locking doors. They're looking over their backs. They're scared. They're distrustful. Could the establishment be after them? What are their next steps? What are they going going to do next? What are we going to do next? At some weird, odd man who sort of resembles Jesus, steps to them, shows up, and proclaims to be the Messiah. In 2021, it looks like a scam, and so heartbroken and exhausted with worry, they needed Jesus to show them 
that he was Jesus. Look, you can't just say you're Jesus after everything that's gone down. And so Jesus has to meet them where they are, even if he wanted them to be somewhere else, if he expected them to be more spiritually mature, in a different place. He has to meet them where they are on their spiritual journey. We often do not meet folks where they are, but we want them to be where we want them to be, which leads to a lot of pain and frustration because they fail us inevitably because we want them to be somewhere they're not. We expect certain things out of our loved ones, our friends, our close family members, and when they don't deliver, we are disappointed. In fact, this same sort of dynamic existed in the text. In fact, this same sort of dynamic exists in our society today. And so when folks, celebrities, and the government and elected officials do not live up to our expectations, we get frustrated and we move into what we call a cancel culture. For example, a hot topic in Georgia this past month has been the hot topic of voting rights. The Republicans see it as moral integrity, while the Democrats see it as an attempt to suppress voter rights. Well, Coca-Cola and MLB, the Major League Baseball, believe the potential new laws could curtail people's right to vote. So they have come out against these new laws. The Republicans are mad, they're upset, and they're boycotting these two, these two companies, Coca-Cola and the MLB, right along with the Texas governor refusing to throw the first pitch at the Rangers game. We want folks to be where we want them to be. And when they're not where we expect them to be, we boycott, we cancel, we get mad, we're frustrated. Megan Phelps Roper, the author of Unfollow, A Journey from Hatred to Hope, says she was raised to view others as evil. She was brought up by her grandfather's religion, and she was one of the avid followers. In case you guys haven't heard, she was a part of Westboro Baptist Church. And she was protesting as early as five years old and felt that God was using her family to do God's work in the world. She says the more persecution they received, the more happier they were because they felt like God was using them and that God was getting joy. She took a joy in going to veterans' funerals and protesting. She was all into it 100% because that's what her grandfather was teaching her. She was the apologist for her family on social media, and people would bring it, and she would give it back. And she loved arguing with people except there was this one person, this one person who didn't argue back with her, but sort of showed up, sort of showed up and met her where she was. This person instead told her he appreciated her tenacity. He appreciated her faithfulness. He appreciated how committed she was to her God. And so she began to develop a relationship with this person on Twitter. He would ask questions here and there, but it wasn't the same. And so she lowered her defenses. She began to look at what she believed, and she began to see some of the contradictions of her family's religion. And it was eventually with Chad. It was eventually with that person who just showed up and showed up where she was that she began to share her concerns. If any of you are avid readers and have heard her story, Megan Phelps Roper eventually left the Westboro Baptist Church. She eventually was able to look and realize that what her family was preaching was not real. But one of the things she advocates for and says, if someone hadn't showed up and showed me and been present with me, I might still be in my grandfather's religion today. Megan advocates that we talk with one another, that we engage one another, and that we meet folks where they are because sometimes through those relationships, we have the ability to convert and change people from where they're going. 
Jesus had the ability to start where people were. He sat with them. He shared a meal with them. He listened to them. He dropped new knowledge on them. He shared the good news. Jesus shared signs and did miracles. And when the 5,000 came to listen, he fed them first physically. You see, he didn't start out trying to get them on some spiritual gold mine, but he met people where they were. He knew before you can do X, Y, Z, you got to do A, B, C. There are obstacles, there are stones, there are weight that stand in people's way. Sometimes one of the ways we are our siblings keeper is by showing up and starting where folks are. It's a hard lesson because we want people to be somewhere else. We want them to be on our page. We want them to get us. But sometimes the miracle is just showing up where people are. There's this lady, and I, I know her name, but I, I can't share it with you. And I met her a long time ago. And I was trying to do therapy with her, and nothing was working. And I was trying to get her to a certain place, and... It just wasn't working. She was a teenager. She was in a program where I was employed at the time. And nothing I tried would work until one day I learned that her father was in prison. And so I offered to drive the three hours one way to take her to see her dad. This was not therapy as I considered it. But those three hour, six hour, all day drives opened up a door that therapy never did. Well, at first she talked about my driving, and then after we got off my somewhat considered maybe fast, scary driving, as she would put it, we moved on to other topics. And in that time, she came to view what I was doing as showing up where she was. She began to share the information I had always wanted her to share in therapy. Well, I moved on and she moved on, and I never heard from her until seven years ago. Seven years ago, she found me, and she reached out to me and, and said she had been looking back at her years as a teenager, looking back at how tough they had been, looking back at how she had struggled. She had, getting, she had gotten kicked out of the house. Her mom had disappeared. Her dad was in jail. And when she looked back on it, the one thing she could see that was beautiful and kind was the relationship she had with me. Sometimes we underestimate just showing up where people are not where we want them to be, not our own agenda, not trying to get them to point A, not trying to get them to become members, not trying to <laughs> impose our own agenda, but just showing up where people are and meeting them where they are. From the start after Jesus had been crucified, he shows back up and Jesus had to address the, the disciples' shock, their doubt, their disbelief. And a lot of people want to go off on Thomas, but hey, Thomas had been through something. And Thomas was like, you got to show me. They had endured a lot from their past few days. He had to show them that he was who he said he was, that he wasn't some scam or some sort of deranged or mentally ill person. Because I'm going to be honest, if somebody showed up and said they was Jesus today, I might, have, I might, I might pause a little bit myself. Show me. Show me you are who you say you are. We want proof. Some creepy guy walking up asserting that he's Jesus is just a little too much for me right now. Sometimes it's part of our love. We have to show people because they're in spaces. We have to show them our hands. In two places of employment that I was hired behind a leader that was let go on some bad terms, one of the things I noticed coming behind a, a leader with some questions is that sometimes you have to show people, that sometimes people are hurting, that sometimes people haven't recruited her. And you have to be patient. You have to show them that you're in it, that you're on it. Sometimes you have to deal with people's baggage. You have to deal with their distrust. You have to deal with their pain. They look at you and you have to just stand in the mud and be present with them. If you wanna be effective with people, you gotta start where they are, in relationships, in family, in the world. 
Jesus shows them. And because he starts where they are, they come to believe. He shows them his hands. He shows them his body. He invites them to touch him. Because sometimes you have to start where people are. You can't start with where you want people to be. You've got to share the love of Christ with no expectation. Feed the 5,000 with no expectation. Just listen with no agenda. Just be present and resist the temptation to cancel people out because you don't like their story. Sometimes we just got to show up. Speaking of showing up, yesterday I was in the mall, and I'm telling you, I had a good time. I did a little bit of shopping therapy, but I stumbled upon this one place that was doing free art. And you know, in a capitalistic world, when I hear free, I get a little bit excited sometimes. First, I wonder, I'm like, show me, because I want to know if this is some kind of kitsch. But it really was free art. And there were lots of people inside, and so I went inside to see what was going on. And I was a little bit too late on that day, because I had done a little bit more shopping therapy by the time I discovered the place. So they were about to close up. But I went inside, and there were people talking, and there were people having a good time, and it really was free. And what I discovered is it was a church. It was a church in a mall doing art. And so I really wanted to know this story. They are Seventh-day Adventist church, so it's Saturday, and they were doing service as well. And so what they shared with me is they decided they wanted to know their community. They wanted to know the people in their community. And so they approached the mall and said, hey, can we have a month where we just come in the mall on Saturdays and do art with people? And the mall was like, I know you Christians, I ain't feeling it. No, no, you guys put people in hell and all that kind of stuff. And we don't want you here. But they kept talking with the mall. And so the mall changed their mind. And the mall said, said yes. And so after a month, four Saturdays, a meeting with people, it went over well and they were done. They were excited. They had met with their community. They had shared some art. They weren't trying to proselytize. They were just present with people in the community. Well, guess what happened next? The mall calls them up. The mall says, we want you guys to come back. You drew these people. We like you here. We like the flow of your energy. And so then they began to talk. Hey, it's Saturday. We do service. And they were able to set up a situation where they do worship and they do art. And it was exciting as I watched them because they didn't step out and get on the street and say, if you don't give your life to Christ, you going to hell. They didn't do that one. But they started where people are because everybody loves art. And in the mall, there are lots of kids and teenagers. And there are lots of family. And we're looking for things to do together and have communion. They met people where they are. You got to start where people are, not where you want them to be. Show people the marks on your body. Show people the marks on your hand. Show them your scars. Show them your story because our struggles will open up a door for somebody else. Oh, you been there? Oh, you did that? And God brought me back. God was in the midst of it all. We don't have to shame folks for what they've been through, but say if it had not been for the Lord on my side, where would I be? You know the Lord gave me grace, and I just want to tell you about this Jesus that gave me a second chance. Ask me how I know, because he's been so good to me. God did it for me, and God will do it for you. God is a God of second chances. Show them your story, not the pretty version, not the rated PG version. Show them your story, uncut the rated R version. Tell the whole story. Don't leave nothing out, that unfiltered raw version. Show people where God has brought you from. Show up and meet people where you are. Be authentic about who you are. Show up 
And if all they want from you is money, give them money. If all they want is a plate of food, then give it. But just show up. Show them love. Show them bruises. Show them what you've been through. And watch God perform a miracle. Once they knew that Jesus was Jesus, they began to rejoice. Show people who you are. Show them the love of God and watch God do something awesome. Amen.